Hi everybody, my name is Antoinette, this is Good Owl Games, and welcome to May's monthly roundup video, the one where I talk to you about the changes to my board game collection. <laughs> So I'm officially declaring it summer. Um, here in Ireland, we've had pretty much two weeks with no rain and warmish temperatures and the whole place has gone mad. And here I am in a darkened room recording a video in the sweltering heat. So you know it really is summer. Um, so it's exciting. Um, it's nice to see a change of the weather and kind of opening up possibilities of things you can do and places you can see. Um, but of course, that does not mean I'll be neglecting my board game habit. And it certainly is starting to feel like that at the moment. Um, so those of you uninitiated, hello, welcome to my monthly roundup video. I've been doing these for a while now, where I sit down once a month and I talk about the new games I got. Um, the next section is like new game or not new games, but just games I've been playing. And then the third portion is a little bit of chit chat about myself, about the channel, if you're interested in any of that sort of stuff, probably not. But I put timestamps down in the video so you can kind of hop around and pick out the stuff that you think might be interesting to you. So it's lovely to have you here. Um, and yeah, um, I suppose I should just jump right in because there's quite a number of games to get through this month and we're starting off with Revive. Um, this is from a Porta Games I believe, I hope I have that correct. Um, and kind of what made this one sound interesting or look interesting is that well firstly it was in my board game shop so that's always a good start. But secondly, I saw the player boards um, and they are these huge kind of recess boards that you're kind of going round in. And I'll, exp I'll explain the game as best I can. Um, so what Revive is about is that there's been an ice age um, and you and, you know, other people are kind of coming back to earth um, and exploring it and gathering resources kind of setting up civilizations rediscovering machinery um, all those kinds of things so that's kind of the track it's discovery and how the game works is that there is a main game board, which is kind of like the not quite area control portion of the board where you have people who go out and explore and find things. You flip over tiles and see what's on them. Um, and then there is your own player board, which is kind of for exploring machines or expanding kind of your knowledge and setting up the actions you're going to be performing on your turn. Um, so these kind of actions um, can have bonuses and stuff. There are cards that have multi-uses that you took under your board, either at the top side of them or the bottom side of them um, to get what they do, um, which is nice. I particularly like the, the track you go, the tracks you go around as your player board. There's different ones and you'll have to reach a particular point in one track to be able to pass it on another. I like that. And even the area control part of the board was much more exploring um, than competing for things, but this is at two players. Um, it's a very nicely put together game. I do wish it was a bit more colourful, but you know, I guess with the topic at hand, you can't expect everything to be bright and shiny. Um, but it is very well put together and I really enjoyed those boards. Um, the game itself was quite fun because you always felt like you were doing something. There was always the next thing you were getting to or that was going to happen. So yeah, I really quite liked it um, and I would definitely want to play more of it. Um, it's quite a table hog. It takes up a lot of space to play this game I guess that's um, my main complaint I don't know if I even have a, if, if that's even a complaint to be honest because there's only two of us but I can imagine it being a problem with more players but overall I really liked Revive I thought it was kind of interesting um, and like I like going up tracks but different <laughs> and I'm a big fan of that so that is Revive so the second game on this list is a game that has been here before um I'll just jump, I'll jump right into it. I was going to do some sort of fun preamble, but I won't. So this is Time of Legends, Joan of Arc. Um, and many, many moons ago, I had a copy of, of, of Joan of, I'm calling it Joan of Arc. The Time of Legends thing is long. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It's a miniature battle game um, where it's done through scenarios and you could play as the French versus the English. And then there was kind of a mythical element to it as well. It had really good rules and really good gameplay, which is unusual for a game with a ton of miniatures. And we really liked it. <coughs> and the problem with it was 
realized that um, we had played war games before, right? So I've played Warhammer. I used to play War Machine a lot. And we found that by playing Joan of Arc, we longed for those older games that we had played before. So what we did was we moved Joan of Arc on and we bought some War Machine stuff instead and we're playing games with that. Um, but I don't think we ever really got over Joan of Arc simply because of how convenient it would be to kind of have everything in, well, many boxes, or but have a complete set of something for a war game is a really nice touch. We wouldn't have to keep buying more things. And it had all sorts of cool things. So when Joan of Arc went back to Kickstarter um, with all the extras and the like the 10 boxes and stuff, we actually backed it. Um, I backed it for... I think we, we, yeah, we backed for most things in the pledge, which was obscene. I don't think we've ever backed anything for that amount of money. But after the first couple of months, there was we had issues with how the campaign was being run and it just kind of gave us bad vibes. Do you ever just get a feeling of this isn't kind of what they said was going to happen or this is taking much longer than was anticipated? And obviously, Kickstarters are you're investing in something, right? Sometimes things go the way they should. Some things go the way they shouldn't. But we decided to get a refund there and then. And we we're like, you know what? If we really want it, we'll, we should be able to pick it up maybe once it comes out. Um, so anybody interested in board game news and stuff will know that Mythic Games, who the company who make Joan of Arc, um, have been in a whole bunch of trouble lately to do with their projects not being delivered and asking um, their kind of the who they call the crowdfunder people for more money than originally said. Um, in some cases, as much as the original game was to get it shipped to them. And this isn't looking good. Um, it looks like the company is basically scrabbling for money that somehow funds were kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say mismanaged because I don't, I don't really know what's happening here. All I know is what it looks like from the outside, which is people aren't getting their games and they're asking for more money to make it happen. And I think that's a really bad look for any company. So all of this jazz came out and we were like, they're definitely never going to remake Joan of Arc again um, because they're in such hot water with all of this. Maybe, you know, the company will go under. And we decided to look and see if anyone was selling their packs. And sure enough, somebody, so sure, there always is, isn't there? So sure enough, somebody was. And we decided to go to go for it. It actually turned out to be cheaper than if we'd backed it on the campaign, which is a little bit... Ooh, but yeah, 12 boxes or so of Joan of Arc arrived. Um, I'll show you a picture of just how tall they were um, and whatnot. And so <laughs> it's a bit overwhelming, I'm not going to lie, because it feels like we did something really, really crazy. And we probably have. Um, but you know when you kind of can't get something out of your head and you just don't want to give up on it? Well, you know, you kind of can't. Um, so we've decided we're just going to play through all of the scenarios in the books and start at the beginning. So um, I've already played a scenario too um, from ones I'd played before and it's still the good old Joan of Arc stuff you love. Um, you know, nice kind of straightforward miniature battles. Um, I like the way people move in hexes. Um, everyone gets to roll dice and have abilities and things like that without it being overwhelming. I just think it's very elegant to be fair and I'm looking forward to getting to all the crazy stuff that's in the later game boxes because um, right now you know we're just kind of playing with the starter stuff but there are, there are things like villages and dragons and big monsters and knights on horses um, and I'm kind of treating it like an everyday Christmas so you know every time you open it, it's a little bit like Christmas because God knows what exciting thing is going to be in there um, so yeah that's a bit of a bit of madness right there um, I don't know if anyone else I know owns it or would like to own it maybe I think you have to be a specific kind of type of gamer it's a it's a, a specific type of puzzle you know war gaming is um and Joan of Arc I think fits squarely in that albeit nice and tidily um so yeah that's been kind of an adventure for sure and I can't I can't wait to see what madness comes up next because if I remember correctly some of the scenarios are absolutely crazy like you're trying to save the Virgin Mary and get her to a church before a demon arrives yeah that kind of stuff <laughs> it's like history meets fantasy meets what um so yeah so super excited for that so that, that'll be a long-term game that's like a, a frost haven or something like that that we'll get to bit by bit so the wolves from pandasaurus games is one i was kind of interested in when it came out and then i heard its main mechanic was area control and that instantly kind of was a turn off um i find area control games to not be particularly fantastic at two players like it'd have to be a very special game to overcome that problem i have and 
I was, I liked the sound of it. I liked the idea of playing as wolves. So you play as packs of wolves, um, going through different territories and things like that and building your lairs and your dens. Um, like all of that sounds great, but just not air control it too. And then I heard there was a two player special mode added. And I was like, oh, okay. Maybe that makes this a little bit more interesting. And I saw pictures of it online and I, I kind of, I really liked how it looked. You know what I mean? It, lo it, it looked kind of fun and easy. So we picked up a copy of The Wolves. Um, so first impressions for this is that I, I like how the area control works. And what this is, is that at the top of your game board, you have a number of different terrain types. And to be able to activate anything on those different terrains, you need to have a certain amount of them flipped over. Um, so for instance, to make a den, I think it is, or a lair, you'll need to have three of a specific terrain type flipped up. And on each tile for terrain, there is a different one on each side. And every time you use it, it flips it over. So you see, there's a game here about, well, I need three of this flipped over. Well, that means I'll have to go and do this, something else to flip this one, to get it to flip this one. And this was my favorite part of the game by far. Um, I thought this was a really interesting puzzle. Otherwise, most of it is about kind of getting to areas of the map, being in control when scoring happens and, you know, kind of building out things that will help you kind of score the zone or give you kind of points for it. Um, what is also very cool is that you remove pieces from the map so you can convert your <coughs> your rival's wolves to be your wolves or you will remove tokens and things but everything you remove goes on a track and that track is the end of game track so that when a certain amount of pieces have been removed the game ends and i thought this was really ingenious um because it's a great way of kind of forcing people to uh, to either hurry up the game if they think they're near the end or to end the game early something like that if you think you're in the lead but also it kind of forces interactions that you mightn't have want to have done otherwise right it forces people to have to be a little bit aggressive because otherwise the game will never end um and so i have a lot to say about this game about how much i like it but my problem was the two player mode was just there were some wolves from um you know the different player colors put out in particular parts of the map just to make it more difficult to claim that part of the map um that was all the kind of the extra that was there um and while i i kind of enjoyed my time with it and i do, i do think this is actually quite a good game i just think it wasn't a good fit for me um, because yeah, the two player kind of part of it was, well, you know, I'll do this side of the board, you do this side of the board and we'll have to meet at some point or the game isn't going to end. Felt forced a little bit, um, rather than natural. Um, it never felt like there was a really great reason for me to kind of get in my opponent's way. Um, and there probably should have been. But overall, I still think this is a fine game, actually. I just think it's not right for me. Um, so that's The Wolves. And don't let me forget to tell you just how gorgeous it is because everything is pastel. It's pretty. You have wolf tokens. You have little lair tokens. Your game board is beautiful. You play a specific type of wolves. Um, like, it's all, it's all here, really, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, that is The Wolves. Good times. Good times. So this next board game was of my husband's doing because he spotted it on special offer, which is always a great reason to buy a board game you've not played before. And this is Clash of Cultures. I'm going to assume maybe some of you out there also picked up a reasonably priced copy. It was in fact so reasonably priced that we ordered it from the States and paid all the taxes and things and it was still cheaper than buying it here. Um, so yeah, that's how I've ended up with a copy of Clash of Cultures. And this is a civilization game. And you know what? It's been a really long time since I had one of those or since I played one of those. So this was kind of interesting. Um, and there are expectations you have about civilization games, right? You expect to be exploring Exploring out on the map, building your city, getting technologies, and this is all of those things. Um, yeah, and you can you can go to war and fight people too. Um, all of that was here. Um, this one is really nicely done. I think. Um, I think it's a very straightforward way of um, doing a civilization game, which is that obviously 
everyone starts in a separate part of the board and the tiles are upside down so you don't know exactly what's under them and you start out by exploring from your city making more cities um you'll have goals to achieve during the at the start of the game and during the game so you know you might want to be working towards some of those especially if it's controlling cities and stuff like that um the coolest part of this game straight up without any question is the tech tree and it is this giant tech tree board and some of the things in the tech tree will have requirements that you have to have done some other stuff beforehand but there is just such a plethora of stuff in there that i didn't find out about till basically after the first game trying to absorb it all in going oh if only i got science before i did this all of these would have been free um but all of these tech things allow you to do separate things out on the board um depending on what kind of section you choose from so there are all sorts of things you can do um so there's things to do with your horses and your men there are things to do with your cities and you know that you you you've played games before this is just this is just like playing a video game um but you know what it was quick the turns were fast like it didn't take forever um the game was supposed to take about three hours it took about two and a half on our first play and it was very leisurely and kind of playful and fun you know it wasn't stressful um and we were all just trying to unlock more things and get more quests you can build wonders in your city um very cool thing about your city is a little circle and then all the buildings you can build around it are like in a half moon shape so they sit in around your circle so you're like your city builds up in a big circle i thought that was pretty cool um i liked all the little buildings you could do um they would give you different bonuses and things even though they might have been difficult to build and um, there were barbarians in the game but i think we scared them away we weren't really hassled by that um and whatnot yeah it was just really pleasurable kind of fun easy going civilization game yeah, I had a good time just unlocking all my talents and seeing where that left me um, and whatnot. So yeah, it was it was kind of good. I have to say I enjoyed it. Um, I would play it again. It's a shame that it has such a, a time limit like that. But the good news was was that it didn't didn't feel like it took that much time to play at all, really. Um, it was much more kind of enjoyable and relaxing than that. Like very easygoing afternoon of, you know, building your civilization. Yeah, it was good. Very good indeed. Did, uh, did any of you actually pick up a copy? If you did, let me know. And what did you think of it? Because, um, yeah, that was kind of a nice surprise for something being so bargainy. Yeah, bargainy. My new word of the day. All right, what's next? So have you ever bought a board game assuming it was one thing when really it was something completely different? Yeah, I've made that mistake. Um, and this is to do with virtue. Um and it says on the tagline it's to do with governance right governance um and i'd seen pictures of this i actually looked up re a review of this to see what it would look like on the table and what's cool about this is that you have a player board and you have a handful of cards with actions on them and the player board is kind of set in a roundel and you set the cards down into the roundel to choose the order in which your actions will happen and you're able to change that during the game and um, to switch things around and I thought this was a really nice concept and I thought what this game was about was that we were going to be governing cities that we were going to be trying to kind of get influence govern under other cities and things like that just from kind of the box and what I'd looked up um, virtue is not that type of game <laughs> virtue is very much an area control game <laughs> which as we all know i'm huge fans of um where you kind of you start um i'll talk about the two player mode in a minute because that was annoying um where you start basically on one part of the map of kind of italy and surrounding areas and you have a couple of meeples and you have a little marker and you can head out and take over other cities um, and when you do they'll give you kind of resources and stuff like that that you'll need to activate your cards or do other abilities so you want to own more places to give you more cities which give you more stuffs right um, and so that's the kind of idea there are a number of actions you can do um, on your turn and these are all related to what cards you've put down onto your board and so you can you move your marker around you can go like I think it's one to two spaces um, to activate things um, what's very cool about this roundel is that there are cards that sit kind of outside of it and you can choose to activate them if you want to to help you with actions and then they get refreshed when you kind of wander by with your token as you're going around your turns and that's really really cool 
you're able to buy additional people and we were able to make friends with other factions um, and have them be on our side and their cards. I had the Pope, it was very exciting. It's a historical kind of thing, um, for sure. It's set in a particular time period. Um, I'm going to say 1451 to 1470 something. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring that up for sure. Um, and you know what? I think this is actually um, probably a great game with more players. Um, the two-player variant what, um, basically said I could only play one faction and my opponent could only play one faction out of the choice, out of the number that are set in the box. So, you know, one of us had to be France and one of us had to be um, yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me even remember um, that. And I thought that was a bit of a letdown. I think I hate when that happens when you play a game and just because there's two of you, you can't play with everything in the box. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things you miss out on because you're playing at two player. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a little bit lame, but I understand that sometimes if you want to kind of, you have to make the game work, you have to, I guess, make sacrifices for lower player counts. Because this is a game clearly designed for more people who want to go in and hack and go at each other to control the cities and stuff like that. You know, I, it has that feel about it that, you know, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but I just wasn't really interested in that. I was like, I wanted to govern cities. That's what the title says. But really, it's about kind of sneaking around the place and getting into cities with your soldiers. Um, so yeah, um, so that's Virtue. It's a good looking game. It's got some kind of really nice components and I think it's got some really great ideas, to be honest. I think this is a pretty good game, just not the game I thought it was, um, which is fair enough. And yeah, I'm gonna leave area control to the side for a while, I think. I'm just not having much luck with it this month. Um, I always return to it in the hope I'll find the game that kind of fits right or whatever. Maybe I already have one, I don't know. But yeah, it's just, I know area control it too difficult just difficult um right okay so we'll move on to the final game so i knew about this game's existence before it spilled as yara's nominee announcement last monday and this is planet unknown um and so when i heard it was nominated i was like oh okay definitely pick it up now because i'd been considering it but hadn't been entirely sure a little bit pricier than most games and no surprise when you see what's in the box. So Planet Unknown is a polyonimo game where you take Tetris pieces and fit them into your board. It's set in space um, and so when you play certain colour tiles it will send you up different tracks so you can have like different bonuses and things like that from them. You also get a little rover that goes out and collects items for you. Um, but the coolest part of this, without any doubt, is the fact that the game comes with a lazy Susan. That's one of those spinning things in the middle of the table. And it's designed to hold all of the polyonimo pieces. And how it works is that on your turn, if you're the first player, well, if you're the player, if it's your turn, um, you get to spin the wheel and put, choose which piece you want and have it facing you. And then the other players get to choose from whatever section is facing them, they get to pick one tile and put it out on their board. Um, so that way on everybody's turn, everybody's getting a tile. It's interesting. Um, and I think that piece is, I suppose really what is the core of this game, the whole, I choose what I want but you have to put up with the pieces you're getting um so yeah other than that you fill out your board and you go up your tracks um there are some quests you can achieve and um, there's a track for that so you can kind of do mini quests along the way and there are also three I think main quests that everyone can do during the game um so this is to me a fairly standard polyonimo game with a really cool gimmick um, I was a little disappointed with how it looked. It's all in primary colours and squares. And I was like, oh, I thought we might have gone beyond this a little bit. Um, but apparently not. But the game is, is completely fine. Um, it, you know what I mean? It, you're putting the pieces out. You get the pieces in a slightly different way than normal. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, it does have a more advanced mode where you have a unique planet and then a slightly different kind of tech tree or tech track um, than usual. And that was interesting but not like um blow me away interesting um like i 
you know what, I think this game is perfectly adequate, I think is my way of putting it. Um, usually the Spiel des Jahres nominees are easy kind of going games, but they have a twist or there's something, you know, here's the, here's the cool thing it does that you really enjoy or whatever it is. And I just wasn't feeling it for this. Um, like, I think you could have a lot of fun with this, in particular um, with families. I think it, w it would be great. And of course, that's what the, the spiel is all about, f is, is for family games. Um, and I think it definitely falls well into that category. But I think when so much effort and design thought went into kind of the lazy Susan for the piece of spinning, that there would be, um, you know, kind of uh, that same level carried through to the rest of the game. And it just doesn't feel like that to me. Um, I did enjoy my time with it though. That's the truth, you know, it's, it's, like I said, perfectly adequate. Um, but yeah, that, that was my experience with it anyway. I hope other people um, enjoy it. Um, I could see it being fun for sure. Just, yeah, just didn't quite like scratch that itch for me. Um, so yeah, so that is Planet Unknown. So here's where I get sneaky sneaky and throw in a section that we haven't seen in a while because it hasn't happened. And this is the part where I used to talk about trades and then there were no trades but there was was in fact one trade this month and this allowed me to acquire a copy of please don't laugh gkr heavy hitters um yeah again this is kind of my husband's doing but I, I can't blame him he's been looking at this game for forever um so to be able to trade for it i always think is the best way to acquire a new game and what gkr heavy hitters is about is why giant robots and yeah you pl you play as giant robots and the idea is that you're trying to kind of you're in a world where it's a, a sport for giant robots to fight each other and you're kind of trying to gather gather sponsorship and things like that and tag buildings with um you know your name and things like that so the the idea here is that you're trying to kind of increase viewership and sponsorship that it's not just about fighting each other but it's um putting on a spectacle a little bit as well um this is really impressive out of the box i mean really impressive you get four huge fully painted mechs um each come with their own deck um, their own weapons and their set of cards and what you do is you build a deck for your mech <laughs> that rides and in it, it'll have your different weapons or maybe kind of different moves you're going to use or things like that. And then on your turns, you're going to play these cards against each other. They all have an initiative count. So just because, you know, it, it basically means you have to watch of, am I going to be first? Am I going to be last? And so you can shoot each other um, or hit each other. Um, you know, that might be your prerogative. Or you can also win by um, tagging um, four buildings. Um, um, so there's this kind of there's this nice way of you don't necessarily have to be all out hitting each other to win you can, there is another way you also get to summon little robots to help you who do cool little things as well um they're kind of nice and they get in the way and they add a little something to the table um the board is really impressive here because you have these huge 3d towers that are as tall as your mechs and some ruined buildings and things like that going on so it really does set the scene and it helps with you know um line of sight and things like that so i can't shoot you if i can't see you behind the building you get things like that as well um overall i really enjoyed this i think the card element was very interesting um, and the more sponsorship you got throughout the game you got sponsorship cards and these were kind of cool they they did all sorts of like amazing things and um, so you definitely wanted to get those um, I almost battered my opponent to death I got really close to it but I didn't make it all the way so they got all the tags before I did um, but I have to say it was pretty fun um, I'm trying to figure out where the replayability is here I assume it's in the deck building which I didn't think was going to be such an important factor in a robot fighting game but sure enough it is um and so that's kind of nice that you can swap out your weapons change things up and stuff like that and of course there are two other characters to play in the the box and they they all have their kind of their own branding um and their own styles and things like that which is just really cool as well um yeah overall way more impressed with this than i had any right to be i was expecting it to be absolute rubbish when we got it to the table but no it's a well thought out 
game with actual rules um, that make sense, that aren't too complicated and were kind of fun to play with. Uh, I would definitely play this again. I know I will be playing this again. Um, the only issue with it is it comes in a ginormous box that just doesn't fit in my shelf. I was like, I have no home for this. <laughs> but um, it was definitely, definitely fun. So I'm glad I have been proven wrong um, about my, my thoughts about such a game. Um, I assumed we would just be fighting each other and it would just be really boring but no there's more to it than that so good good on it so yeah that's gkr heavy hitters right that's all the new games there were loads like absolutely loads um so i'm gonna jump into what i've been playing very quickly because clearly i've been playing all of these new games too so i'm gonna jump right in here with food chain magnet um this is a game i've had for absolutely ages actually since before i started this channel so there you go that says something um, and it's one I've never got rid of or never thought of getting rid of, but it doesn't get played very often at all. And we had a friend come visit who wanted to try it and we were like, okay, let's go for this. And I expected it to be difficult to teach, actually. I thought it would be hard to wrap your head around the concept. But you know what? It, it, went, it went down really well. And just to tell you what it's about, because I should, um, Food Chain Magnet is a game that in which you own a store um that will create food or drinks or things like that and what you want to do is sell your items and how you do this is that you set up advertising campaigns to the houses in your neighborhood um, to convince them to come to your place to buy your stuff but the problem is is that so you advertise the guy you know the house down the road from you that you know he wants a burger you tell him he wants a burger and you you assume he's going to come to your place but the truth is he could also go to someone else's house for a burger if it's closer if it's cheaper you know there are these kind of things in mind so you've got to convince people that they want only what you are selling um and there can be a lot of kind of going back and forth there where you can basically you know steal other people's people um because you can convince them you you know so you thought you wanted a burger but really you wanted a burger and coke and i'm the only one who serves a burger and coke um and that's how it is um the fun parts of this are you are you start off as like head of your company and you build a structure of workers um into your company and that you restructure every round um to give you different actions or abilities or things like that and that's really fun basically building out your kind of CEO management display um, is good. Um, it's also um, really fun um, seeing where the food's going to end up at the end of the round. Um, so, you know, who's getting fed from where? Is it an interesting thing? And also deciding the optimum places to set up your advertising. And the more advanced advertising you get, the bigger they get, so the bigger the draw they have. Um, and so you're going to watch for stuff like that. Um, but it's it's fun. It's interesting. It is about making money. Um, and so you want to make as much money as possible. The game runs out. Well, the game ends when a certain amount of money runs out. Um, and so when we taught this to our friend, I was like, oh, I don't know how easy this is to understand because it's basic in principle and complex in play. Um, but he got the concept really fast and had a giant CEO network of workers um, rather fast. And that was going down well. Um, and then kind of all the debates over, you know, well, who was going to be selling what exactly where on the map um, went down. And so that, you know, that kind of part of it, I've, I've kind of forgotten how much fun it is um, watching it all fit together. And so I very quietly kept doing my own thing. I was just selling burgers, nothing to see here. And everyone else was going, you know, kind of selling pizzas, different routes. And then there's a point of which you can get drinks. You get drinks, boys. They cycle out and get you a number of drinks and drinks always I think switch up the game a little bit because they're difficult to obtain compared to the basic items and so if you've got them and you tell people they want them you pretty much own them in that kind of sense but what ended up happening was that um I had a bunch of food left over I had a burger cook he that's a card that allows you to keep extra food between turns normally you don't get to so I had a lot of food and I went and I got a bunch of drinks because I saw everyone else had drinks and whatever way it happened their advertising went oh people want this and this drink and I was the only one who had it and I emptied the kitty and that was the end of the, that was the end of the game I'm not sure I've ever won it before um, um, but it was good to have like, you know, stayed on target and focused on giving the people what they want. Um, but I think I had convinced myself it was a much more 
um, difficult game than it actually is. I think getting to grips with it initially, maybe, but coming back to it like that and sitting down and playing it, I was like, this is actually way more fun than I remembered, um, and that's calculating. Now, I know there are ways you can play this game with specific openers. You could go and read up your strategies online. All of that stuff exists, but um, I've never been that type of player and I'm not about to start. I just, you know, gun it with whatever I've got. <laughs> uh, so that was Food Chain Magnet. Um, do any of you play it? Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things that's kind of hot to have, I suppose, but I'm not sure how often I see people actually pulling it out. Um, but that would be cool. All right, and the second game I want to talk about, and um, this entire section of games I've been played seems to have been games I normally play at two players but got to play with other people, so I think you should hear the word, um, is a little like that. So a little while back, I picked up Wormholes from AEG, and I wasn't entirely sold on it from the concept, but the play of it was really good. Um, it's a game in, in which you are a space taxi driver and you're picking up passengers and you're trying to deliver them to different planets out on the map. The cool thing is you and everyone else can make wormholes to shorten distances. So you can leave a wormhole at one point, finish it at another, and then be able to travel between it um, for a space of one movement instead of, you know, loads. Um, and that's what's really awesome. And you can use each other's wormholes, which makes it even better. So the board gets full of these kind of networks that people have built to get to places. And I really liked it. Um, it's very chill, very quick to play very very fun um i also think it's quite clever in how it's put together as well um it just if it it kind of it just plays smoothly it's just nice and so i enjoyed it too and then we had some visitors around and we're like we need something we can play with five players let's go with wormholes and i wasn't sure how this was going to go because i was like it's a bigger board there'll be way more wormholes what's going to happen and will people like this idea of being a space taxi driver and um, sure enough the sure enough they did i think there was a bit of res uh, reservation initially about the idea of it until you see it in action and so everyone started out kind of near the start and then everyone made a wormhole near the beginning so it was like this network of of wormholes at the like the, the main hub where you can go to get cards and things like that and get other passengers um and so it was fun traversing the board you know going well i'm going to use your wormhole and i'm going to use your wormhole and every time you use someone's wormhole, they get a credit. So it's great. And you don't have to pay for it. It's just space. Um, so it was really fun, actually, trying to see people trying to get to places. We had some really epic turns as well, where people made it all around the place and handed in loads of um, travelers. So it was, you know what? It was really fun. It didn't take very long to play. And everyone really enjoyed it. And of course, we had people naming their ships because you have a ship, you, you must name it. Um, and then, you know, making our way around, around the world around around the space um yeah not the world space um so yeah i was really impressed with that more players i think i liked it even more on the the second play um, than i did on the first just something very um elegant and easy going about it and that's just it's quick as well so that's really great stuff so yeah i thought you should know about wormholes uh, i think everyone should know about wormholes it was really good and um, so that is everything i've been playing and and buying <laughs> it's a lot and now I'm going to trickle over into the, the bit like the chit chat section is what I've been calling it, where if you want, you can hear me talk a little bit about some stuff and maybe the channel. Um, and I'd love to have you there. All right. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. I hope it was worth the wait and uh, it's entertaining enough. Um, I'm just very quickly going to go through some of the stuff that's been happening um, around here, I guess. Um, like I sit here and I try and remember what I've done over the past month and then I'm like, gosh, it's really not a lot. But here we, <laughs> here we are. Uh, so the first thing is to do with the channel, I suppose. Um, so I have one review um, left ready to go. That should be out next week or the week after. And after that, I might take a break for a month or two, depending on how I'm feeling. Um, I've been kind of continually making stuff for a while it would be good to just take a break maybe here over the summer just for a little bit and see how I feel about things anyway in more positive notes I have been going to the cinema plenty um and I've been going to see some pretty um crazy stuff um the the one that stuck out that I uh, that I won't recommend for people to go see is um a movie called Bo is Afraid and <laughs> um this is a three hour long movie um, about a guy who basically who's 
fears and his his kind of paranoia um becomes real like it's actually out there in the world it's supposed to be kind of a horror comedy i didn't see the comedy in it i i saw a lot i i saw the mental illness in it and i i felt i felt afraid the way Bo does um it's a bit wacky a um, bit weird i think if you like something kind of like what the hell did I just watch? You're right on track here. Um, but for whatever reason, I watched, like the, I thought the opener, like the start of the movie was really good and I thought the end was really good. I thought the middle was really ho-hum um, and dragged a lot. But after I left the cinema and I thought, I, oh, thank God, you know, I'm getting out of here, I kind of haven't stopped thinking about it. There's parts of it that I, I every so often I wonder about and there's kind of an overarching story in there as well. It has a, it has a good end that makes you think back upon everything. Um, so I did enjoy it, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> um, yeah, it was pretty, uh, pretty unusual stuff for sure. Um, I'm trying to think what else I saw um, recently. Um, well, I saw the new Guardians, the Galaxy movie. Um, what did you all think of that? I'm sure more people have seen that. Um, I thought it was all right. I think it needed some sort of trigger warning for like animal abuse. I was just like, I was not prepared for that when I went to see it. I was like, this is a, this is a lot. Um, but um, I think it wrapped everything up kind of nicely. Um, and so, yeah, that was not terrible. And finally, because I have a cinema pass, which means I get to see all the movies pretty much for free, I went and I saw Fast and Furious X. I have never seen any other movie in the franchise. I just kept seeing the ads for it and Jason Momoa is in the ads. I sure you remember him as Cal Drogo from Game of Thrones. I'm kind of a I'm kind of a fan and he just seems like a nice person. And so I saw him as the villain in this movie and I'm like, I don't know. I like they're throwing a car with a helicopter off the side of a highway. Is this what this is about? Um, but I decided to go anyway. Myself and my husband went together. He couldn't believe I was willing to go. And I was like, then it was some kind of bet where I bet you won't go with me. Oh, oh no, 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 no. You'll have to go and then I'll have to go. It was one of these. So we ended up going together. And you know what? I was a horrible snob about that movie. Um, it was really entertaining. Um, Jason Momoa was outstandingly good as basically the Joker of the, the movie, um, which was good. Um, like, I think I just switched my brain off when I went in, you know, they're, they're rolling a bomb through the middle of Rome, you know, the try and, it, and, and it explodes like nowhere somewhere near the Vatican and no one is injured everybody no one gets hurt in this movie just just feelings and families um but it's an unusual world you know um the world of Fast and Furious where guys have deep bonds and friendships with each other the women seem to be all really kick-ass and strong and powerful and they're kind of they're doing their own thing um and then the villains seem to become the friends right the movie afterwards apparently that's how it happened if you were a villain before you were a friend in the next movie mm, i don't know i also don't know how they got so many famous actors into the same movie i was like that's Shirley Shirley theron what's she doing here um you know uh, and voila <laughs> so it ends on a cliffhanger because apparently it's a movie in many parts um, which was a bit disappointing, but I was not disappointed with the movie. Um, I was mildly entertained the whole time because it was just so over the top ridiculous. I'm like, there has to come a point where he explodes or the car explodes. But no, the car just seems to follow him from continent to continent for no reason. I don't know. Um, but if you're into that, into that stuff or if you want to just go watch stuff explode um yeah that you know that i can recommend it for but it, i have to say i was pleasantly surprised cool so other than cinema stuff what else have i been doing i have been out on my bicycle which currently has a puncture oh um because the weather here has been really good so i've been like right this is my chance i'm gonna get on my bike i'm gonna get fit on my bike and i don't know what it is about my body and bicycle and cycling but it seems to forget how to cycle every time i cycle if i haven't done it before i'm like oh god so like i went through this the end of last year where i had to cycle basically for three or four weeks straight before my body went oh i see we're cycling i got it and then i couldn't cycle for a week or two because the weather was so bad and i went back on my bike and it was like i had to start from the beginning I'm like why so I'm in the process of starting from the beginning I think I've been getting somewhere and now it's got a puncture I'm like this is really sad um so yeah that's been my um outdoors kind of excitement um other than that 
I have been doing some bird watching as continued, um, some bird photography, making an attempt. I recently learned that, you know, heat can mess with your bird photos. That was shocking news. And I got to go to a couple of cool places as well. I have a few photos, I think, of those. Um, so that's been nice. Um, yeah, because there's a good stretch in the evening now, as they say. Um, so there's, there's plenty of time to kind of go out and do things, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, I think the only other piece of news I suppose I have is that I now own a gimbal. Uh, for those of you uninitiated, a gimbal is where you can put your camera into a gyroscope thing to hold it steady while you hold it like on a stick and you move it around and the camera does cool stuff. Um, I've been making little videos with it. They're kind of the first impressions videos I've been posting on social media. Just, you know, the first time I play something, I just whip it out and I, I run it down. Um, what I have noticed is that uh, my anxiety makes me quite jittery and uh, you really see it in the footage. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, the whole point of this was to help me, you know, so I wouldn't have to be so jittery. I also think I need to, you know, build up my arm muscles a bit. I was not quite ready for this. Um, but um, I'm working on it anyway. So far, it's been really interesting. It was supposed to make my life a little bit easier when it came to making videos and stuff because you could just hold everything instead of having to set everything up in a, a rig or a tripod and that. So I'll see where it leads. I think it's got tons of potential and it's a very cool piece of kit. And I was having a lot of fun with it. It's just heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just weak because everything's heavy um, but I'm looking forward to finding kind of cool ways to use that and also I have a plan at some point to put together a video to talk about my board game collection someone asked about it um, I think in the last month's video and I've not forgotten but I've got this gimbal you see so that should help me kind of run along the shelves um, I just need to get enough energy together to manage that so that's that's on the cards that might just pop up on its own are you interested in seeing where my board games live and what board games I have I resorted them at the weekend and I already regret the way they were sorted. I tried to put them together by the same kind of mechanic, right? But you know what? Board games have loads of mechanics, loads of them. So I ended up with two games and I'm like, what mechanics are these? Where do these even belong? Um, so yeah, I regret that choice. Maybe I'll change it back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's been the, the fun things in my life, like movies and birds and bikes. Um, and Warframe. I don't know if anybody plays a lot. Of, everyone plays video games, right? Like everyone does. I'm a big fan of a game called Warframe. It's a free to play um, kind of shooty game. And normally I would not be interested in that stuff, but this one's really fun because you play, you have a Warframe and there's loads of different types you can play as and they have special abilities and special ways to play. Um, my personal favourite is one called Octavia and she's like a bird and she has a disco ball and it rolls around the field that gathers up all your enemies for you and you can program music for her to dance to um, and whatnot. Like she's amazing. Um, I, lo I, lo I just, I think I love the ingenuity in these designs and you don't need to pay any money to play it you can farm all these things yourself in the game and you can just turn it on and give it a go i'm not really promoting warframe i just i enjoy it i think it's really fun um and it's a game you don't have to be very good at which is brilliant because i can't shoot straight you know for any good reason um but you can there are loads of ways to just kind of enjoy it and hop around so maybe if you're into that sort of thing check it out um, so yeah, that's been my world and I'm going to go and enjoy the sunshine because God knows how long it'll last people. Enjoy it while we have it um, for sure. So thank you for tuning in and for watching. If you, I want to hear, you know, what your month has been like, because this is not, not just my monthly roundup. I hope it is yours. I hope you take stock of things and I hope you go, oh, you know, have some reflections. Who knows? Um, that'd be cool. All right. So tune in again next time, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.